of all, this morning, I want to welcome everyone to AZ Bio Peers for February. It's a little bit past Valentine's Day, but we love you all. And um, I'd like you to, um, I'd also like to thank Jordan Policy Group, who um, opened up their office space to us today. Um, so I'm imagining that you're all here with me around the boardroom table. Um, as we kick things off, um, I am thrilled to have with us the team from JLL. And um, John and I were just uh, sharing memories of when we worked together on a project going back about five, six years now. And uh, JLL has been a wonderful partner for all of our uh, bioscience team. But I am going to let them introduce themselves um, while we've got them full screen so you can see their smiling faces. <laughs> and then um, I will be bringing up their PowerPoint and they're going to lead us in a discussion on finding a home for your innovation. So with that, John, what kick us off? Absolutely. And I'm John Cunningham. I'm actually located in New Jersey. I'm part of, along with Grant and others, part of the, the uh, leadership structure for the JLL Life Science Advisory Council. Uh, I co-chair that as well as, and work with, um, I would say from the, both the user side, if you will, the, the life science companies and the owners of life science, real estate uh, across the country. And I think, uh, so, uh, as Grant knows, I'll just start talking. So I will, <laughs> I will pass the horn to him for a second. All right, sorry guys, I was on, I was on mute. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I, like John, part of the GLO Life Science Practice team, I'm in San Diego, so a little more local or regional to the Phoenix area. And um, yeah, thank you, John, for having us on here from the JLL side and excited to be part of, part of the call here and, and, and connect. And I can, what I thought I could do when the time is right is share a little what's going on in the region because there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on in San Diego, Orange County, LA, and then I know Phoenix as well. And so our Southwest region, I know it's, it's very active from a life science standpoint. Okay, and Mark? Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Mark Gustin. Uh, I'm here locally in the Phoenix JLL office. Uh, myself and Bill Hunsecker, who is not able to join the call today, are the, uh, the co- leads of the local life science practice here in Phoenix. So with Grant, John, and the group around the country, we have a well-rounded uh, life science practice and uh, are happy to be here today. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Mark. And with that, I was just going to say, Joan, for, for those of you, uh, sorry that I was on the call. I, I'm, I'm on voice. I'm in a bad spot here for video so I didn't want to be the choppy guy video where you could hear every other word so I'm just doing a dial in but I apologize for not being able to be on video absolutely thank you so John I'll just kind of as we jump in a little bit um just so everyone knows our colleague Audrey Sims who's the head of research life sciences research for JLL out of Boston and New York actually she lives in New York is going to come on probably in about 10 15 minutes and this is this will be her slide deck um, Audrey is an invaluable team member of ours and has such a great, um, you know, kind of constant handle on what's happening in life sciences, where, why, and how. We've never spent so much time, I would say, in the last year, not just talking about what's happening on the coasts, but what's happening really everywhere else. From, you know, we used to think of um, many different areas as, as secondary or tertiary markets. And the, the question we always ask and every market should ask of itself, and I'm, John, I'm sure you do this all the time, and mostly explaining to people, why my market, why Phoenix? And right now that's become why Houston, why Pittsburgh, why Chicago, why Nashville, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the amount of money that is poured into supporting both the life, the life science industry from both, not just from the uh, investment in you know, research and the company side, but the investment as a, a, a uh, an asset class of choice for uh, developers and, um, <clears throat> pardon me, you know, and, and, and the equity on that level has never been as high as it is. We're, uh, you know, both for us and, and others, you know, clients who are building speculative lab space in multiple markets and, and intending to build the scale. We had once, you uh, know, one of our uh, 
colleagues had said there's about 200 million square feet of existing R&D or life science space in the country. And there's probably a demand in the next several, in a number of years to double that. And that isn't all going to happen within 10 miles of the, you know, one of the two oceans. You know, this is going to be something that is going to continue to happen in markets like um, in Phoenix and, and, and many others too, which is fantastic. Um, so we, you know, and Grant and I are not, not just being part of the Life Science Advisory Council for the company, we are also have a team that we're doing national advisory work for both on the tenant side and for the ownership side. You know, clients who are going to build speculative lab space in multiple markets and, and, and build those to scale and build the top quality product as, as you'll see anywhere in the country. The reason we wanted to, yes, yeah, I was gonna say, the reason we wanted to bring that up as an important from the user standpoint is as you maybe some of you know, building lab space is not cheap. It's it's not you know there's a large capital expenditure that has to happen. And when you're an R and D or a biotech company, those the money that you get in from the venture capital firm or from um, other partners, you don't want to have to spend that toward real estate. And so what's happening across the country is generally speaking, in you know you have your Boston, San Francisco, San Diego, the three main hubs. In those markets, I mean, speaking for San Diego specifically, we're about a 16 million square foot market and of, of dedicated life science space. And that has grown by probably 30% over the past five, six years. And we have another eight to 10 million square feet of space in the pipeline that's gonna be built. Now we have the landlords like Alexandria, Biomed, Health Peak, Phase Three Properties, those larger life science landlords that they're going to come in, they're going to build those, the space on a speculative basis. And that's what we see happening across the country. And I think Phoenix is going to be in that, including in that conversation here relatively quickly from what we're hearing. So there's going to be speculative lab spaces in that market where you can go in and, and, and find space. And so I think that's really what the conversation is tailored to is, okay, when is that going to happen? We don't have the crystal balls to win exactly, but we see that on the horizon probably sooner rather than later, John, if you would agree. No, absolutely. And I think it, it's, it's key to understand what just kind of what, what you're looking for, when you need to start looking for it, when you see it, what actually is it? And it's having the right team. And that's not just real estate guys like us, but that's having, uh, it, it's all the, the folks that we work with, with you in terms of design, in terms of engineering and architecture, in terms of construction, uh, in terms of, a, you know, understanding what a facility is, whether you're talking about um, being able to locate in the right incubator you know, or really going and saying, okay, there's, make it up, there's seven places we could look. Some are building from scratch, some are existing buildings, life science buildings that just need to have the space built out. Where does that dollar go? And how far does it go? Um, I often find people, you know, uh, the adapter for use of, of life sciences infrastructure sometimes gets overlooked because they say, oh, I can build that in a warehouse building somewhere, except you don't have the power and the plumbing and the, uh, the floor load and the ceiling height and the, the, the zoning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there's many things that go into it and all those, all those items that don't get really understood up front. And then of course, against the backdrop of what do you really need? How does it need to look? What is the three to six to 12, the 24 to you know, a month run look like? What do you need today? What do you need tomorrow? You, no one can really figure out what three to 10 years from now is going to, you know, the need might, might, might be for sure. But it's understanding how to get to the end game with, as, as Grant said, if it costs anywhere, and there's many different kinds of lab space, so just accept the range for this moment, it could cost anywhere from 200 to $300 per square foot to build out lab space. And part of that range is dependent upon whether this is, uh, you know, other, you know, 52 fume hoods in it, or even what's the blend of office space into that. So figuring something more in the, you know, 60% um, laboratory and 40% kind of, you know, other administrative or office, that's a lot of money. And if you are in a scenario where the landlords who have the vision to produce this space are saying, I can, I can put $100 a foot of that on the table, there's still something to be made up there, two thirds of it. There are going to be owners who are taking a new look and we've got clients doing it kind of in this mode. They're gonna be looking to put something over 200 to $225 a foot into the space 
for several reasons. They know that growing companies don't have a, a war chest sitting there ready to spend on the bricks and mortar so much as their research and their people. And they know that this space is, is incredibly useful, is going to be useful when company A outgrows it in three to five years because the next company is going to come in. They're not going to respend that money because they're going to build that company A space to a standard that is going to be highly flexible and have great value for the next player. So those are some of the very critical things. And it does take time. If there is you know, speculative office space, you know, being a first mover in a market where you've got, a, you know, who's going to build that lab, you know, whether it's in, you know, near completion or whatever, is going to be, it's going to, you know, how fast can I get into that space? I need to be in that space within three to six months. That's a very aggressive time frame. Space had to be built, especially you know from design through permits through construction. You're talking about something that could easily be nine to fifteen months, depending on what it is. So it's 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 very critical to have that understanding of the landscape, what the opportunities are, and the ability to tell the opportunities apart. So you best you know are uh, uh, conserving and uh, your own capital and your own treasure, as it were, but also making sure you get what you need and you're not going to spend an enormous amount of time, effort, or money two years from now because, we, you know, it wasn't, we didn't think of it now. So there's a lot of great forethought that can go into this that will really help accelerate, you know, your company or that life science company down the road and really set the stage for that next, whether that's you know, a future expansion, whether that is, could be IPO, you know, whatever some of the ultimate goals are going to be. For sure. Mark, what are your, some of your thoughts on, you know, I, I'm just kind of current, uh, whether you're talking about existing former incubator space or accelerator space, like, like we talked about yesterday, if you will, and then you've got new opportunities uh, downtown, et cetera. Yeah, and, and John, I think you, you touched on it, and Phoenix is a relatively new market, and some of those, and, you know, you look at uh, the former Henkel building now called the Loom, which was, uh, you know, obviously a transformation of an existing project, the one we work on down in Chandler Santan Tech Center, former manufacturing building that uh, the city of Chandler developed some incubator space. So um, we have had very little that has been ground up. Uh, obviously, the, the second part of this program, which will be on Thursday, is the new Wexford project, but uh, very little has been designed uh, from the beginning for life science. So Papago Gateway, which is a project we work on was one of the few that was designed for life sciences. Interestingly enough, uh, it ended up filling with non-life science users initially. Um, and the bottom was built for a vivarium. It's actually leased to a university, right? University, the upper floors uh, are first solar. We did do the Keras life science deal. So that was one of the first um, sort of retroactive lab uh, requirements we put into a building, but that's a building that has the infrastructure, the correct floor loads, everything else that could be turned in today. So there's about 80,000 feet in that building. But um, again, its initial design, I think, was very forward thinking. The market at the time it was delivered was more heavily geared towards office. That's what it filled with. So to, to John's point, um, right now, Phoenix does have very little of it that's been built, purpose built for this. And obviously, Wexford is, is delivering right into that. I think there's more, more to come in the future. I would agree. I think you're going to see that there will be other, and I'm not saying we, we're not like, you know, twisting our mustaches like we actually know what the next three are going to be yet or something, but there, there is other interest in developing in these critical markets and these emerging and maybe more than emerging, you know, the, the great work done by you know, uh, AZ Bio and Joe, there is an awareness. And now as you look towards next steps, it's how do we get, some more there, there, if you will. When's that, you know, a purpose built, you know, uh, life science, you know, when is the next one gonna come online? How is that going to align with the other institutions and stakeholders in the market? Is it going to be, you know, east, west, north, or south? You know, is it, you know, whether it's up near Mayo, whether it's gonna be the downtown biomedical district, whether it's in Tempe, whether it's in Chandler, you know, I'm not trying to put too too close a, uh, you, know, a you know, a ring on the map with that, but it's it's, it's the vision and the conviction of those who will develop those spaces that will enable this to grow. So the companies who are, you know, in the market now growing up here, want to be here, have somewhere to go and don't have to 
face, well, what other market should I, can I go to? It isn't easy just to go to San Diego or to the West Coast, uh, not only from a, a availability standpoint, but a cost standpoint as well. It's not always easy. And, and, and then, of course, it's, you know, who's tied to which, you know, you tied to a university, where's your funding coming from? So we've kind of created a large cauldron of many different uh, data points that are all really very critical to understand and to really craft, help, help you know, whomever craft your future so that there are there as few surprises and as few expenditures beyond what should be as, as you move forward. Right. And John, I think you bring up a good point where the, you know, the universities and what we've seen um, to those on this call, what, what we've seen across the country is the proximity to universities, major universities, especially strong research universities has been where developers, life science developers want to try and cluster and utilize the infrastructure of the university system. And also I think from those on this call, when you're growing a company, you, one thing you need is is you need the space. That's one thing. But the other thing I think is way more important is you need the talent. And so how do you get the talent to come on on the R&D side, whether that's PhDs, STEM, undergrad, uh, whatever it might be, is to try and be close to that talent. Where the, the And so that's why I think a lot of the, like in, in Pittsburgh or uh, in other Houston areas, other markets, Denver, Boulder area, you'll see these clusters start and they'll form around the university. I know from speaking from a standpoint of, of San Diego, th you know, kind of keeping things regionally here, UC San Diego has been a, a huge um, pro producer, I should say, of, of STEM students. I think our UC San Diego produces, I think I, I heard more than Harvard and MIT combined undergrad STEM students. Now, Harvard and MIT have many more PhDs, and those are some of the key decision makers within these companies and starting companies. But UC San Diego has so many undergrad STEM students producing out, coupled that with the, the, universe, the, the research institutes we have in San Diego, as well as some of the big pharmaceutical companies. And, and, and that's what it takes to create the cluster. And so I think what, what we see is then the facilities then form around that from a real estate side. But you see these different components here coming together. And so where does that bridge into Phoenix and the different areas of Phoenix and whether it be the, the, the facility, the infrastructure, the personnel and kind of and bringing all those things together in, into the right areas. And I, I, I think unless I'm reading it correctly, Audrey, are you on? Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. So great. OK. I don't know if you heard me give you a great introduction before. I'll do it again real quick. I do not. Audrey Sims is our JLO's life science director, and this is not the, I'm going to screw up the title here, but, you know, head of life sciences and healthcare, I believe, research yeah. for the company. Mm -hmm. And the this, this slide deck, I mean, everyone uh, has been aware for many years, JLO does an annual life science cluster report and ranking, with which you're seeing the 2020 rankings right there. And um, I, won't, I, won't, uh, I won't give away the end of the story. <laughs> Thanks, All yours, Audrey. Great. Um, <laughs> thanks so much, John, for the introduction. And um, yes, yeah, so my name is Audrey Sims. I'm the director of research for life sciences and healthcare. Um, I'm based out of New York, and I'm in charge of kind of keeping track of changes and ascendancy in the life sciences real estate universe, which is a really exciting space right now because we're really seeing the rising tide of in um, <clears throat> capital and interest, investor interest, uh, ra raising all boats. So not only are our classic core markets like Boston, San Francisco, San Diego um, increasingly strong, but we also have um, emerging markets of which Phoenix is one that are gaining steam as well at the same time. So that first slide that you're seeing is basically um, that's our life science cluster rankings from last July, which is when we release our annual reports. And you can see that, you know, Boston, San Francisco, San Diego were at the top. Um, this year, when we release our report, we'll be including um, more markets like Austin, Dallas, Phoenix, um, Pittsburgh, that we see increasing opportunity um, within. 
So stay tuned for that. Um, we're really excited to introduce that later this year. Um, just if you can go to the next slide. Just to kind of orient you toward the space, um, US lab inventory right now is roughly 150 million square feet nationwide, which I always like to highlight to, to kind of give a sense of what the investable universe is um, currently. It's very small. It's only about 3% of all office inventory and 1% of industrial inventory. So you can um, you can tell that it's really, it's it's still a relatively niche opportunity, although it's become much more secular over the past couple of years. And I think it will be increasingly trend that way. Um, but I always like to start with this just to give people a sense of what exactly we're talking about. So uh, in terms of the supply and demand balance, you can tell you're already kind of starting off on a really favorable footing, um, especially since the demand case has been soaring this year, but really for the past several years. Going to the next slide. Okay, just this is just a brief overview of the national fundamentals drivers, um, which, you know, pharma, although it's not just pharma, there's also medical device is an important part of the industry as well. but especially in this case, pharma is kind of um, the main noise for life sciences. And given the rapid acceleration in, in technological advances, even this past year, um, CRISPR won the Nobel Prize. Gene therapy is really rocketing forward and producing um, new opportunities you know, const on a constant basis. This really enables increased drug production um, and the demand to match both for demographic factors with the aging population, as well as the rise of, um, you know, kind of millennial families, which are also produces a lot of drug demand, um, but also because of the, the technological advances are making strides toward not just treatments and therapeutics, but actual cures, which opens up a whole new frontier for pharma. So um, these two charts kind of highlight the strong growth for both drug production and drug demand. Going to the next slide. Um, so this slide talks a little bit about another important um, trend that really got highlighted last year in 2020 which is that the approval process for, for the FDA novel drug approval process is getting um, going to a new higher baseline. Over the past couple of years, um, you've really seen a, a step up in drug approvals, especially with COVID. You saw a lot of fast tracking, which was mainly for um, like remdesivir, but I think that will, will be sticky because kind of once you let the genie out of the bottle with fast tracking, it's hard to get it back in. So as um, drugs are approved on a more streamlined basis, you're going to also have more um, that'll bring more profitability to life sciences companies because often the journey from, you know, the drug development journey, as you know, is extremely long and there are many years that are pre revenue. So that's an important change um, in the industry. And then R&D spending, which has been extremely you know, voluminous for years is, is only projected to increase pretty steadily over the next couple of years, which again will reinforce positive um, trends for the industry in terms of getting to profitability quicker. And then of course, um, you know, R&D spending, venture spending is where we get our rent payments. So it opens up a whole new um, group of tenants. So going to the next, oh, also just very briefly on this note, in terms of policy change, not to get too far into that, but it does seem that um, the administration and the kind of the winds are blowing toward making drugs more accessible price-wise, which will expand the market pretty considerably. And we, the life sciences team at JLL sees that as a, as a positive for the industry. Going to the next slide. Um, talks about the investment thesis industry drivers 
you know, I, in terms of um, capital markets and equities, life sciences couldn't be hotter. 49% of IPO activity in 2020 focused on healthcare, which is, you know, mainly for life science devices as well as pharma. Um, the IPOs within life sciences returned 100% above their opening day price. Uh, we, we don't think there's, we're not particularly worried about froth, just given the massive both structural with demographics and cyclical with you know, the vaccine and therapeutics development that are pretty solid here for life sciences industry. Um, venture capital increased 44% year over year in 2020, which is massive. And I always like to highlight not just because of COVID, but also oncology, um, cell and gene therapy, anti-diabetes, obesity, neonatology, CNS. It's a very, um, it's kind of a healthy mix. And the growth in employment is, um, over the past 20 years is, is really steady. It's added one fifth. And what I always think is striking is that um, there are 10,000 diseases, but only 500 treatments, according to Milken. So there's a vast remaining potential for expansion in the industry. And then in terms of real estate, you basically have kind of what you're always looking for in commercial real estate, strong demand and high barriers to entry. Um, and I think the other thing that has emerged this year is that lab space is is some um, is relatively resistant to remote working there is some segmentation of administration administrative functions like you know hr and payroll and that kind of thing but the actual lab real estate is definitely needed for collaboration and experimentation so you know it it tells a good story for phoenix in particular john if you want to go down to the next slide um I think this is an interesting slide. It doesn't have to do with life sciences, um, you know, only, but it does kind of speak to this, what I think is a big tailwind for Phoenix and other similar markets, which is that we looked at um, LinkedIn population migration, just showing where people are moving and getting new jobs. And it really heavily favors as, is not particularly surprising, Sunbelt markets over kind of the traditional East and West Coast, which are your cluster markets right now for cost of living, um, in many cases to take advantage of remote work opportunities. Um, in it could be like one half of a couple is able to work remotely. And so, you know, that family might be more willing to move and go to a different, a different market um, for a life sciences job. But it, it's a really, I think this is a really striking trend. You, it's a very clear migration pattern um, based on cost of living in the end. You know, life sciences employees are employees and they have families and want, you know, to be able to afford school and houses and all that stuff. So it, that can be very hard in San Francisco and Boston. Um, moving to the next slide. For Phoenix in particular, um, you know, I don't have to tell you all the natural advantages, the weather and international airport proximity The um, it's, you know, Phoenix has a lot to offer in terms of lifestyle. And then, um, you know, the spinning off of the 16 companies from the Translational Genomics Research Institute is really kind of the beginning of that incubator activity that we look for to determine cluster viability. And then this just talks a little bit about, um, the construction projects plan, which I have detailed in the next slide, which I think John can send out if he hasn't already. Um, and then, I mean, this is just kind of telling you about what's currently available in Phoenix, which hopefully will form the nucleus of a more lasting cluster effect. And then these are just the, the development plans um, kind of that I alluded to earlier. This next slide, if you wanna go down to the funding. Yeah, so this is one of the two major um, funding sources for life sciences companies. The other is venture capital, other than IPOs. Um, but basically it shows massive growth, especially you know um, on a total level. It looks like ASU has really climbed quite a bit over the past couple of years, which is what we want to see. And with the Mayo expansion and the growth of the PBC corridor, you know, that should really create kind of that virtuous cycle and the multiplier effect on innovation, um, which then draws increased yeah. funding. 
So it's, you know, it's definitely a good story and it shows that there's a new level set, which is what we want to look for in terms of getting in the door for real estate. The next one I'll kind of go over quickly. Um, that is VC funding. You've had a couple of major rounds uh, over the past couple of years. Um, the total funding has grown massively since 2015, um, especially with diagnostics and which uh, molecular diagnostics is really thriving with the molecular intelligence full fox and um, the use of AI and personalized medicine is a major growth area for life sciences in general. So that's definitely a good thing to be at the forefront of that. Um, and then basically this next, the last slide just talks about growth and employment um, and establishments, both of which are pretty substantial over the past several years um, and on par with Chicago, Houston, and Denver, all of which are relatively established life sciences clusters. And so it's a, it, there's a lot of positive um, tailwinds here that I think are ripe for, you know, for um, opportunities. And that's basically it. Um, does anyone have any questions? Audrey, that was terrific. Thank you so Great. much. And, You're so welcome. Um, you know, as we continue to grow the life sciences here in Arizona, the, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges we face is for our emerging growth companies that don't need 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 square feet. Right. Um, what are you seeing as best practices in these more established hubs for creating homes for these emerging life science leaders? Well, so that's a great question, Joan. And, you know, from a real estate perspective, often you do want bigger occupiers, but life sciences works slightly differently in that you really need to see the growth on a very small level, as you know. So once you have basically the way it goes is you have your, you know, your major research institution, your research hospital, your university, et cetera, and that kind of starts the engines going and then you want to be able to spin off companies from there to create that incubator effect. And so many of those companies only want, you know, 5,000 square feet. Um, and that in many markets, like for instance, in um, Boston, there's a lot of, um, a lot of life sciences properties are developed with that in mind and they include, you know, different sizes of suites for small companies down to like 2000 square feet. So, it, you know, it definitely, the industry is definitely not set up just for 20,000, 30,000, 100,000, you know, your Glaxo's of the world. It, there is a lot of attention paid to those small suites. Um, and now, it's- we're, we're working with, an, in a number of different markets around the country, not on the East or West Coast, owners who, as we design with them, what their building needs to be. It's great right. to build a spec lab building, but what does it entail? You've got, you've got to activate that building. You've got to have not only amenities and things of that nature, but amenities that are more specific to this industry, how this industry likes to cluster amongst itself, is how to uh, uh, kind of create the, a creative collision was a great, uh, it's probably a, couple, a little bit dated as a term right now, but it, it's still every bit is applicable. Yeah. But it's, it's getting, it could be in conjunction with the university or another, um, another institutional player but a, a, an incubator and accelerator that will cater from the, you know, two or three bench, you know, scientists and, you know, give them that first runway to then be able to grow to a 2000 to 5,000 or, you know, and eventually um, you know, one scheme or rather uh, path. One of, one of the major developers is doing on the West coast is called, you know, they call grad labs. First floor is your incubator. By the time you're in the seventh floor, you've up, you're on the seventh floor. You know, you really, you graduate up through the building in terms of what facilities you need and what functions you need to support it. Um, and, and then you example. have, you also then have, you know, those suites ready for the next round of innovation too. So you, that's how you kind of create that cluster effect. And that goes back to what is one of the most critical things is speed to market. 
It right. doesn't help you much if your re- your science is ready to go, your company's ready to grow, you've got a, you're on a targeted path, but it's going to take you a year to get into a space. You know it, that that becomes debilitating. It's the ability once as you cycle companies through these younger spaces that the spaces are still every bit as flexible and usable and functional as they were for the first one, two, or three um, tenants, you know, that were in them. But they're also available over the weekend when someone moves out of one and they grow into another. And Joan, what I would say on that front, and that's what Phoenix right now is currently lacking. And again, you know, referring to the Santan Tech Project down in Chandler, that's exactly what was designed for is to be, you know, in, in the office world called the spec suite. So again, it's, it's highly usable, it's available, the infrastructure is there, and the challenge has been, and, and that project had 1,300 square foot base to 2,500. Um, over time, they've been taken over and Amcor recently vacated, and now there's, you know, the ability to go back and retrofit those, but there are very few options today, which I know is the frustration of the um, initial users that are out there looking for smaller space. So, so this is uh, Stefan Johnson. I, I'm sorry I'm late. I got the wrong link um, to a, a vaccine meeting. Uh, but um, yeah, it, you know, just to, I think uh, what you portrayed is right. But for us at, in Phoenix, you know, the, there's a lot of growth potential, which Joan and Claudia and everybody are trying to promote and they're doing a great job. But I think there is a rate limiting step here that that we've had some experience with lately. And that is, you know, my company has 17 people and we're, we just completed a raise. And, but when you go out and look for space in this, in the Valley here, and we've got a great broker working with us, we've been doing this for four months. It's, there's a fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is that there's no built out lab space available in the Valley. And so you, there's plenty of shell space that you can build out, but that's gonna take you six to nine months to build out. And for a startup, when you get a raise, the clock starts for the next, right. to the next raise, right? And so you can't afford six to nine months to build something out. And so the, what we have here is a rate limiting step that there's virtually zero built out lab space. And if you go to, I just did a survey of, which you guys have done much more extensively, but in Boston, Austin, Madison, Wisconsin, um, you go to any of those places and there's built out lab space available. And in, and then in addition, there's built out shell space, you know, which you, you could even use, but we don't even have that here. Most right. of the places we looked at, it didn't even have the air conditioning and, and water installed yet in the, yeah. the vacant space, right? Um, and it turns out they're telling me that part of the, the biggest thing is rate limiting is getting the lighting order to, to, to light the spaces. Everybody's saying they can't get lights, um, so, which is crazy. Uh, but so that for a startup to, to go out and try and uh, get a, a space going, it's really inhibited here. And if, right. what I think what is really needed is for the city, somebody in the city to step up and build out 10,000 square feet of lab space. It's available then with no buyer there ready to take it yet. Take the game. Exactly. Yeah. And then have somebody go in and start occupying. And then that, that starts the ball rolling and you keep going, but nobody stepped to the front yet. Um, Wexford is starting to do this. Idea was supposed to do this, but they didn't do it uh, yet. And so, you know, I, I think that's our fundamental problem here. That, this is why Madison is a better place for biotech than we are. Yeah, I mean, I think you've hit on a really good point, which is that it does, the time to get in the building for life sciences tenants is much shorter than any other tenant type. I mean, from the time they sign, they wanna be in within like six months or so which is very fast considering, as you've noted, that their you know, lab space has extremely stringent um, regulatory conditions for HVAC, water, air exchange, clear heights, all that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, that there has been a major trend um, for people wanting to convert office buildings into lab in many markets and which is happening, although not really on the scale that 
you might think, um, because it is difficult to, not every office building is gonna be a candidate for that kind of there, conversion. There was a time last spring that I don't think a, three days went by that we didn't get a call from somebody who had a lower, low office occupancy who said, it must be the right thing to do to make this into a lab. Right. Yeah, exactly. And you know, unfortunately, 98% of those conversations were, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You, know, you don't have these 58 things we're gonna list right now that make your building a conversion that makes sense as opposed to building it from scratch. So right. that's, you know, that's the other part of it. Um, but once, and it, part of it's a vision, part of it, this is a different story than it was five years ago. You didn't find as many people willing to, to build on spec. I think now, yeah. not only is, forget the popularity of it, but, and it's not just the pandemic that's creating the need for more of this uh, very uh, robust infrastructure. That's exactly. very much contributory to it, but it will continue onward. Um, that's and, what, and that's why I always say that the pandemic, because a lot of people just think it kind of started with COVID, which is not the case at all. I think that's the cyclical tailwind, but the structural tailwinds have been there for a long time, both demographically and with drug development for a wide variety of, you know, medical conditions, not just COVID. So I think um, our job or our goal is to bless you, get people comfortable with the demand side of the equation so that the spec, you know, kind of makes more sense. Because the thing is, it's, you know, life sciences companies are pre-revenue for a long time. It is, it can be, you know, a tricky proposition to build for that kind of tenant. Um, but, you know, especially as this industry is accelerating by leaps and bounds, it, it, and, you know, especially compared to kind of the frontier of other commercial real estate opportunities right now, I think it does make increasing sense. Um, and I think that it's never kind of too early to be aware of what you might need. You can't right, start exactly. the process. And Stephen, you're doing it now. You could have you could have started six months earlier, but you still wouldn't have found what you you know by comparison. However, I, it's so often that I, we need to be in, in in nine weeks. You know, <laughs> and sometimes and sometimes here in the East, quite frankly, there's a lot of adaptive reuse of former pharma campuses. That's mm -hmm. almost doable in some cases. Uh, it gets a little crazy, but the more time you give yourself, not only to understand where you might be able to go and the myriad of things that have to go into that decision and execution, but to really understand with the help of, you know, other professionals, what are you, what do you want to be? How do you get there? Um, oftentimes I see both clients and, and, and from the other side coming to look at space, but not really, it doesn't gel in their mind what they really need until they physically get to stand in the middle of it. Yeah. Or they see that I didn't need that that's already here, but I need, you know, it's et cetera. So it gives it a different dynamic. So the earlier you can start and understand it's, it's a, it's a dynamic relationship when, you know, for your company and with those who can help you. So John, the um, investor market, I think is a good lead in that. So we spend a lot of time cultivating our life science investors to invest in our life science companies. Um, Thanks to JLL, I've had a number of opportunities to speak with life science real estate investors who are looking to um, do some of those adaptive reuse projects that um, Audrey and you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that um, you know, we've seen in some parts of the country are adaptive reuse of um, retail space. You know, we're, we're seeing massive changes right now in the retail landscape. Um, and those right. facilities do have, um, you know, different kinds of HVAC power and, you know, other capabilities. Are you seeing any of that? You know, I've seen a lot of discussions, but have you seen anything percolate around? There's an interesting example. It's actually, Audrey, closer to us. It was a former Walmart that became a grow facility for cannabis, because if you think of it, for all the reasons you just mentioned, ceiling height and power and big wide open floor space. Right. Now, I, I haven't heard of lots of those. Um, I know in Colorado, there was a, I think it was a uh, former Novartis campus of about 400,000 feet. I think it was the big Canadian, I forget their name, the big Canadian outfit, the cannabis outfit acquired that. 
it's got so many, you know, it's probably overbuilt in many ways. Maybe it may be too robust, but that, that infrastructure in place and not to go down the cannabis route here, eventually that will be government regulated and to be in former FDA GMP type of uh, quality space is going to mean a lot. All the guys who are doing this in their garage are going to be out of business because right. there's no controls in place. I've got, you know, pilot scale GMP area is going to be perfect as long as you can make, understand what it takes to run it, if it's too robust or be able to scale it to where you need it. So I've heard people talk about retail, is, but I haven't seen much of it yet. So one interesting thing that we saw is that there's a lot of closed restaurants. Closed restaurants, a lot of them have the infrastructure already in place. They've got sufficient HVAC. They even have yes. walk-in freezers. They have everything. The problem with that is to, they have to be rezoned. So that adds another three months to your time frame for getting converting those. If, if that, you could convert those readily, many of them are freestanding uh, units. You could convert them readily to laboratory space, but um, the zoning is inhibitory. Stefan, we've even seen locally groups, to your earlier point, looking at industrial space, because a lot of times the, the zoning change is not required. But again, I think the challenge is they're starting to understand that when you get to these bigger facilities, they have a lot of infrastructure, whether it's redundancy on multiple power grids or uh, backup generators and those type of things. So, you know, the building is one part of it, but it's getting to a place where you get the other redundancies to go out on your own and to buy a buy or lease a restaurant and to go retrofit that and then create the redundancies or infrastructure. That's that's where it becomes incredibly costly. So that's sort of the challenge right now because of yeah. Um, the lack of space, to your earlier point, we are seeing people, especially people that need sizable spaces, looking to non-traditional assets. And the challenge we're running into, which John touched on initially, is that it's just the out-of-pocket cost. So the farther away you get from it, the more of you're looking at the, the bigger the delta of what you need to come up with on the infrastructure, the, the, alloc the cost allocation to, to get it ready for use. And, and from the retail side, it's not scalable. You know, your re your re I'm sorry, your restaurant side. It's it's a piece of space. You could do it, and maybe it's two, three, four, five thousand square feet. But you're never going to. The laundromat's still next door, and so there's a tough mix. And you do you know you may run into some issues. You know, again, zoning becomes a fun thing at that. Point. Yeah, the zoning. You know, number, is and sorry, Roger, real quick. Another what you're seeing industrial conversion a lot of the time, it, 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 and maybe still more here on the uh, in the East Coast and Mid Atlantic is uh, cell and gene therapy, or being able to take great advantage of the fact that there are significant ceiling heights for, in terms of biomanufacturing, uh, et cetera, and great power and zoned right already and already in an area where the industry, you know, the life size industry is flourishing, whether that's in New Jersey or, or Philadelphia or Maryland, et cetera. There's a, those, and Research Triangle Park, especially. What we've seen here locally, there's one group in particular, one name, the name that's looking for about 10 to 12,000 feet of clean room. And that's, you know, the lab definition, what I'm finding is a very broad definition will vary depending on the user. Everything from benching to 100% clean room. And Stephen, to your point, there, there aren't many options in Metro Phoenix. So we are seeing people, and there's one in particular that's looking right now and say, hey, we're looking at industrial, we're looking at a lab space. The, the real estate is only one component, but the clean room, which is another long lead item um, to get in place. So they're, they're looking at that, and they're looking at an industrial space right now as well as lab. So it's an interesting time, uh, I hope that Metro Phoenix continues to evolve and to and, 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 this you know, point. It will. Putting, um, modular, putting modular clean room space into place, it doesn't make it cheaper because it's something you can move into an existing facility. Right. And necessarily, it's still, it's still a clean room environment and there, there can be lead, lead, long lead times on that, but uh, that's definitely a, uh, an opportunity. Someone who's got, we had a group who, they didn't need a huge space. They had 3,600 square feet, I think. They had just done a uh, partnership with, I think it was Takeda, and they basically took lab space, took half of that lab space and, and gutted it and created their own modular clean room in place. Now they can't take it with them when they grow, but they they went to a place that was scalable so that they can grow. Yeah, and we did one of those in Chandler, the same thing it was a 2000 foot lab that they're, they're putting in about 400 feet of uh, clean room. So you make longer lead items, you know, lighting is one, these clean rooms, uh, very few exist. So uh, ordering and, and installing uh, a clean room does take a long lead time above and beyond sort of the base building. Or it could be there's a facility that has an, a, mass, a massive amount of, of a clean room and you just can't pick off small pieces of those. Sometimes former um, pharma campus or even building 
it's very difficult to divide the cost to do so from just from a mechanical and HVAC and power standpoint is prohibitive. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, or frankly, sometimes you can get more space cheap enough so you don't have to do that because the owner realizes that the dollar not spent by you or by them is to everyone's benefit. Um, and that just goes, oh. I, another note that I that left myself here is understanding what you're looking at when you're looking at space. I think you can all understand what an empty warehouse is and that it does, that, that probably doesn't have 90% of the infrastructure you need, but also, you know, we talk about a warm shell versus a cold shell um, in terms mm -hmm. of developing a new building. You know, it's how much money has the landlord put in to make your, basically to make a tenant improvement allowance focus 100% on in, within your space, not enhancing the mechanical system of the building to help facilitate your space. And so, you know, often there's a, um, you know, I think most every landlord who's building life sciences based space understands, you know, they're bringing that, you know, all those utilities, everything to the peri periphery of the tenant's potential shell. And then just you know, the distribution within the shell is fine. You know, so that there's a, it's understanding those things both from a cost perspective and an engineering perspective. So I, I would like to make, I, I, the clean room stuff is interesting there. there I actually put that clean room in, in uh, the Chandler uh, place originally. So the, the, right. um, the, uh, what I would suggest that would kick off uh, things for us here in the Phoenix is that we, somebody puts a million dollars into uh, outfitting the idea center floor that's available. There's a, there, it was supposed to be that way. It, it's not being done, but somehow, Joan, you find somebody to put up a million dollars, which would convert 10,000 square feet to standard lab space in the idea center. And I think it would kick off, um, you know, startups in, in the Valley. And John, since I see you're taking notes, um, you know, interestingly, the building Stefan's talking about um, is anchored by that conditions. So, um, you know, that complex with VD resident in it, um, you know, is already a really nice anchor opportunity for collaboration. And um, Arizona State University is a hot skip jump away. Um, and as we talk about clusters, you know, the development of the clusters that we have here, both, um, you know, in the Tempe Idea Campus and then the Phoenix Biomedical Campus, um, the growing campus that we have in Oro Valley, which again is a, a real interesting um, opportunity. But as we look at the, um, you know, the, the various facilities around the valley, you know, we have seen a, an amount of reuse where, um, and just as you see in Boston or New Jersey or California, um, you know, a smaller company gets a space, it outgrows that space, it moves into a slightly larger space. The next smaller company moves into their space and they start to leapfrog from lily pad to lily pad, right? So, you know, as we talk to the investors um, in the Valley, but most importantly outside of the Valley. Um, and Audrey's hopping off, but great presentation, Audrey, thank you. Um, but as we talk to those real estate investors and interestingly, real estate investing is something that Arizona investors really do understand. Um, so as we start to look at the, um, you know, potential, whether it is the incubator, colo type of space, or moving into a standalone facility or mega facilities, I think that's an opportunity. I think the other opportunity, which is going to be significant, we're seeing that in, in a semiconductor space right now with TMSC and, and others, you know, TMSC is coming. Others are looking at seriously at Arizona. Um, there's going to be significant political pressure um, to bring certain types of manufacturing back on shore. And Arizona has the components that those organizations are going to need. So I think that as we you know, we'll work with the investors and you know, leverage Audrey's presentation, which was phenomenal, um, with the things that Arizona has, right? Affordable power, affordable living, emerging talent base, um, emerging life science clusters, the opportunity not to, to be stifled by not just the um, costs of places like Boston and South San Francisco, but also, you know, 
rezoning something in Arizona and rezoning something in San Francisco are two completely different conversations. So, you know, as we start to go through these things, I think it creates a real um, priority. Now, as we're coming up on the end of the hour, I do want to, uh, number one, thank the team from JLL who were just amazing in um, working with us. And when I, um, I'm gonna flash the, um, the last slide in their presentation that actually had at the end of this one, before we close out. So you have their contact information. Um, and then of course, you can always just email me at jkw.atbio.org and I will be happy to connect you with them. Uh, but as we're wrapping things up, um, John and Mark, I'd like you to kind of think about our, you know, our early stage emerging companies. And if you were gonna give them, you know, one or two quick tips as they start looking for their home for emerging life science companies, their home for innovation, what's your favorite tip? John, why don't you kick us off? We always try to be not as self-serving as we might be in moments like this. <laughs> no, but seriously, it, I think it goes back. I said, what I said earlier was make sure you have an understanding of kind of what you want, what you think you need, but have the right team around you that, you know, the relationship you have with people who can help you from the time you're a single, you know, you're, you're five people to the time you're 50 or a hundred people is the same relationship. It isn't based. And I've been doing this for decades like that. You, I've worked with companies who started in a thousand feet and before the lease started, we're in 10,000 feet just because as they, as they grew and, and, and sometimes the opposite, you know, it, it, you know, funding does play a part in this. So it's, it's being flexible on many given um, levels. And I think that's, that's the key to know what you're doing, know who you can do it with. It's going to help get you there and who's going to be involved from the beginning to the end and, and after you move in, because it's a constant conversation about where to go next, what's happening. What's the guy across the hall doing? Like his space. You know, I may need that if we get, if we get approval from the FDA on X, Y, or Z, or we can expand our indication or whatever it is. That's my two cents. And to further, John, and again, I think what we've touched on it, it's I, I think flexibility, at least in the near term, and knowing that the options today are limited. Um, but uh, there are some labs, interestingly enough, in, in buildings that were not mentioned here today that uh, from time to time may have some space. So I, there, there are some uh, opportunities out there. Again, it's not... Uh, completely zero, but I do understand the frustration. I would say flexibility, I think in the near term, is gonna be the key as well as looking to potentially uh, partner. And there's some things that are not traditional uh, opportunities out there that uh, partnering with the right group, they can make you aware of those and, and try to help find the best solution for you. Terrific, and Stefan, you've done this exercise multiple times. Uh, what would be your tips or our emerging life science companies? Get a good broker that knows the space. And, and, and I agree. I think that um, as we go forward, those are really, really important um, things to, to keep in mind. And most importantly, you know, build a great company. Because if you're building a great company, you're going to attract the investment, you're going to get the resources, and more importantly, you're going to grow out of that space and need a new one. And so, you know, it all plays together. And I really want to thank um, our speakers from JLL today, John Cunningham, Mark Gustin, um, Audrey was terrific. And I don't know, Grant, if you're still there with us, thank you. Um, I also want to um, you know, give a shout out and remind you that this is part one of this discussion. Part two is going to be Thursday, the 18th at eight o'clock where we're going to have a virtual tour on the Phoenix Biomedical Campus um, hosted by Kyle Jardine and the group from Westford. Um, as we see the newest um, piece of the Phoenix Biomedical Campus which is now up and running 
Um, also very exciting is um, we will be hosting live and in person, fingers crossed, um, the Arizona Life Science Innovation Showcase during Arizona Bioscience Week on the Wex, in the Wexford building. Um, and that will also be where we kick off um, Invest Southwest that evening and then um, continue rolling on um, to um, celebrate Arizona Bioscience Week. So I have already told our JLL friends that they are all invited and everyone in this call is of course invited too. Um, but again, um, thank you, Stefan, for um, you know, leading our Q&A discussion. And um, thanks all of you for joining us. And a big thank you to the team from JLL um, who joined us today to share their insights. And uh, anyone who would like to see a replay of this presentation or get other information, you know where to reach me at jkw at acbio.org or Natalie at azbio.org. Um, and we will be more than happy to help you make those connections. So again, um, let's go grow some companies and fill up some spaces. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.